excited to bring you this message. It's titled, God Wants You to Know This. What to do when the situation goes from really bad to worse to even risk of death. And before we pray, I want to thank every one of you who have been praying for my precious grandson, Jaden. Jaden is still at Children's Hospital. Um, <clears throat> I'm taking a break to take this and get some of his favorite foods prepared. He really is a fruit lover. And so I've been running around getting what he wants um, as he's now regaining his appetite, praise God. And so again, thank you all for praying. The doctors are telling me two, three days, maybe he'll be out. And I'm telling you, what, what a situation when you see a loved one, especially a child, at the point of having to be airlifted. And uh, praise God, he is alive. And I just want to thank you all so much. And Jaden himself, if he could be here with me right now, he would be thanking you and thanking our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray and then get into the message that I believe the Lord has given me for us for this hour. We are in the final moments of the end of days. Abba, we love you. Yeshua, Jesus, we love you. Ruach HaKodesh, we love you. Holy Spirit, hallelujah. Father, I pray your anointing that these words will be exactly what you want uttered for your glory and our good and so that we will be equipped and prepared to fulfill the destinies, the ministries, the appointments that you have for us in these final moments of the end of days. And this we pray in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Well, we're going to go, if you'll turn in your Bibles with me, to Exodus chapter 5. Now, this is not my normal Bible. This is a King James, a Bible that I use here at the pulpit at times. My, my most used, I have a lot of Bibles, my most used Bible, and I love it. When I open it up, it immediately flips to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. And that is because that is used almost daily. I go and I pray the Ephesians prayer. So we are going to go to chapter 5. And I'm going to begin with verse 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Pharaoh did, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters, taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, These are those who manage the Hebrew people who are slaves in Israel. Ye shall no more give the people straw to make bricks, as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Now, I'm going to stop there. So, we know that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And in the Bible, you know, I say this all the time. To 
understand the Bible. And as 2 Timothy 2.15 says, to rightly divide the word of truth. In fact, the verse says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that or workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In order to rightly divide the word of truth, you must know who's speaking and to whom. There are three people groups in the Bible. In the Old Testament, you have the Jews and you have the Goyim, the nations. What we translate in the New Testament and in, actually in some versions, some translations, as the Greeks, because the Greeks were Hellenizing the world at the time. But you have the Jews and you have the Gentile, the Gentiles. And now in the New Testament, we know from 1 Corinthians 10, 34, it says, give no offense neither to the Jews nor the Gentiles nor the ecclesia. We translate that word church and that encompasses everyone who is born again whether you're a jew or a gentile you become part of a new people group we know from the bible that we are baptized by holy spirit the same spirit into one body how and when we are baptized into the body of christ meaning we we are born again the nanosecond the raptosecond <coughs> the zeptosecond the instant you believe the gospel of our salvation found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead. That's right. The instant, the nanosecond, you believe that Jesus was the Son of God, God the Son, always existed, and he shed his precious blood and died on the cross. Paying our sin debt, the penalty for our sins, once and for all, past, present, and future, he was buried and on the third day rose from the dead. When you believe that, you are the word like in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, I'm a whosoever, are you a whosoever? Believe it, that's the Greek word pistuo, it means I have faith in, I believe, I trust in, I am firmly persuaded. In what? That Jesus is the Son of God, God the Son, always existed. He had no beginning, and he has no end. Jesus always existed. He shed his blood, and that he rose from the dead. When you believe he is the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christ, and that he died and rose again, you are born again and dwelt with Holy Spirit, saved, sealed, and sanctified until the day of redemption, heaven bound and rapture ready. And what does it take? Again, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is so beautiful. There are over 200 verses in the New Testament that we are saved by solo fide. Faith plus nothing equals salvation and eternal security. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. So many people, even in many churches, believe that you have to live to a certain standard, that it's by your faithfulness or your righteousness in yourself. We are, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for God made him, who's him? Yeshua, Jesus, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christ. Christ is not his last name. Christ is the same. It's the, when they translated it into the Greek, it is the same as the Mashiach, the appointed one, the Son of God, eternally self-existing God in the persons of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Jesus left glory, laid down his glory, was incarnate, born of a virgin, wrapped in flesh, never sinned, lived a perfect life, shed his precious blood to pay our sin debt, 
once and for all, past, present, and future, and on the third day rose from the dead. Hallelujah. The gospel never gets old. I have people criticize. You teach that all the time. It is the plumb line. Praise God. And this is important. So now, as born-again believers, God wants you to know this. What do you do when what's really bad goes to worse, even to the point of despair, destruction, and death? So, in the Bible, to also understand, you know, all of the Bible is for the believer. Not all of the Bible is about the believer. And you need to know who's speaking and to whom. So if you want to know, all of it's for us. Praise God. All of it is for us. And our canon of scripture, praise God. I love the word of God. And I pray you do too. It's alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. The Bible tells us that. Hebrews 4. Uh, yes, in Hebrews 4. I believe. <laughs> That it is sharper than a double-edged sword. That it pierces between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. And is a judge and discerner of the intentions and motives of the heart. Now I gave you my paraphrase. There are, that encompasses a lot of different translations. The, the original Greek. The Bible also tells us that the word of God shall not return unto him void. So it's alive and active. Praise God. Now in understanding the Bible. And again, to the believers, while all of it is for us, not all of it is about us. You want to know what's about us? Read the prison epistles, the Pauline epistles. Like I mentioned one, Ephesians. I tell new believers, read the Gospel of John, and then read the book of Ephesians. Now there are, in the Old Testament, there are a lot of types, patterns, and foreshadows. Pharaoh, that I read about, the king of Egypt, was he would set himself up as a god, actually. Pharaoh was a type of Hasatan, of the devil. Egypt is a type of the world. And the bondage, the slavery that the Israelites were in, in Egypt, is a type of sin. It binds you up in bondage and despair. And so keep that in mind as we talk about it. Now, the children of Israel were in a horrible situation. They worked from sunup till sundown, and they were treated poorly. And if they did not do enough, uh, and, and even if not, the slave masters, the taskmasters, the Bible talks about, would beat them unmercifully. And the treatment of the Jewish people in Egypt was horrific. Now you have enter Moshe, Moses, and Aaron, and they're approaching Pharaoh because God is about, listen to this, God is about in a moment of great despair, in a moment of tragedy, God is about to deliver the people. And I'm going to tell you right now that you may feel like things are overwhelming in your personal life. That things are overwhelming in the world. That it can't get any worse. That, that you just went out in despair. And I'm here to tell you in those moments. And yes, that moment is going to come where that trump will sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And then those of us who are alive and remain as first, Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18 says, will be caught up in the air with them to meet the Lord. And so shall we be with the Lord forever. And we are told to encourage one another with this. This, you all probably know, is referring to the rapture of the church. And it is imminent. Meaning any moment. We are in the final moments of the end of days. Until the rapture of the church, we are to be lights in this darkened world. We are ambassadors of Christ, and we are to, according to the word of God, occupy and redeem the time. I have told my children their whole life, live like you have, uh, live like today is your last day, but plan like you have a hundred years. Well, we know that we're in the final moments, but this is not about our escaping. I want you to see he is coming. Don't, don't get me wrong. He is coming. Hallelujah. 
The bridegroom is coming. But this is about the fact that we are the glorious church. We're to go from glory to glory to glory to ultimate glorification. And I want you to be encouraged today for the believers. I, and if you're not a believer, I pray as I outline the gospel, that you will believe on Jesus, that he is the Mashiach, and that he rose from the dead. So that you are born again, it is a done deal, you will be heaven bound and rapture ready. But the children of Israel were in such despair at the time. And as if it wasn't bad enough, Pharaoh then says, remember I said he's a type of devil. The bondage and slavery is a type of sin, and it binds you up. And it puts a burden of yoke on you. This is why when Jesus said, and I believe it is John chapter 8, the woman caught in the act of adultery. They brought her to Jesus. And they expected him to obey the Mosaic law and stone her. Do you remember that account? And Jesus said to her, first, because they were accusing him and trying to trap him, Jesus bent down and wrote in the dirt. And I, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically. Many people believe, as many theologians, that he was writing their sins. I believe he might have been even writing their names. Who knows? But whatever he wrote, one by one, the accusers left. The oldest to the youngest. And Jesus looked at her and said, Woman, where are your accusers? And she said, I have none. And he said, neither do I accuse you. See, when you have an account with Jesus, when you believe on Jesus, huh, it's a done deal, hallelujah, that he's a Messiah and he rose from the dead. You know, it never gets old. Praise God. You know what? Give him praise. Give him praise. Wherever you are watching this right now, give him praise for he is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. Yeshua, we love you. We praise you. Hallelujah. Well, many try to twist that and say, Jesus said, he had, she had an encounter with him. Now don't go, now, now go and sin no more. Because if you sin, you know, you'll no longer be saved. That's not what Jesus was doing anyway. Jesus knew that if she went and continued committing adultery, they would take it to task to bind her up, imprison her, and kill her. That's what they do. And see, it's not about our salvation, but it is about Pharaoh being the type of devil and that bondage being a type of sin, that it will place such a heavy burden on you. It, there's a saying, and I don't know who made up the saying. It might have come from Charlotte's Web, for all I know, but... Or, or fueled by that. Oh, the tangled web we weave when at first we do deceive. And when we deceive ourselves, when, when we, as believers, when we grieve Holy Spirit, because he does not condemn you, Romans 8, 1 tells us that, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He does not convict you to sin as a believer. Holy Spirit, who indwells you, convicts you to righteousness. He's always pointing you to Jesus. He wants you to be renewed in your mind. Know your identity in Christ. Positionally, you are seated as a born-again believer because your spirit is alive in Christ. You are positioned, positionally seated in Christ in the heavenlies. He is seated next to the Father. And when our Father, our Heavenly Father, sees us, He does not see us in our performance here, meaning we're not perfect in performance, we still sin, but sin can no longer be held against us because it was already adjudicated. Jesus did that legally on the cross, having never sinned, he paid our sin debt. He became sin for us, our sin was imputed to him, and his righteousness imputed to us when we believe for all time. Done deal. Praise. Again, it never gets old. And so you have, while we're positionally seated in him, sin still leads to death temporally or here. 
It cannot rob you of your salvation. It is a done deal. You are heaven bound and rapture ready. But if I went out and I went to Skid Row and I started shooting up drugs and being a fornicator, I could get diseases that could literally take my life. I could overdose. There's a consequence. Can't rob me of my salvation. I'm already born again. That is a done deal. It was already adjudicated. There is no double jeopardy in the heavenly courts. I am already born again, seated in Christ positionally in the heavenlies. Here, when we get caught up in those things, sin will continue to try to drag you down. Have you ever noticed in your own life or in someone else's, maybe not even a believer, they begin... You know, like marijuana, it's legalized in I don't know how many states. But I know even as a young man, I've never done that, even as a young man, and I don't take any praise, I give God all the glory, I just don't drink, smoke, do illicit drugs, I don't do that. I, I sin, I, I, I've sped in my car, there are other things. You guys know, I'm not standing here bragging on me, because I cannot. I, I brag on Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. Hallelujah. But I'm using it as an example. So say I say the gateway drug, right? Marijuana. And then that loses its appeal. And and often when people are partying, doing drugs or drinking, other sins seem to attach to them. Why? Because it binds. Well, here we have a, a wonderful depiction, a type of the bondage. And so when, and I'm going to tell you this, when you are leaning into God, pressing into God, allowing the Holy Spirit to do that in and through you, you're turning, I like the word turning into God, not just turning toward God. You are already a child of God. It's a done deal. But when you are turning into, pressing into, I often say this new level, new devil. And if the devil can bind us up, into a sin that we get caught up in, then it weighs a heavy yoke on us. And so this bondage of slavery in this account is, in fact, a type of sin. And so Pharaoh had, they, the Egyptians would supply the bricks, and the Israelites would have to build and work hard labor. From sunup till sundown. And if they didn't, they would be unmercifully beaten. Now Pharaoh says, listen to what he did. And, and this is what sin tries to do. It, it places a heavier yoke on your life. And I'm telling you, we're, there are sins of thought. We have 70,000 a day. There are sins of omission, things we should do that we don't. There are sins of commission, things we do that we shouldn't. You guys know, I don't have to explain to you. You know, if you know something's wrong and you choose to grieve Holy Spirit and not listen to him, he's a gentleman, you can do that. You can allow your soul to overwhelm your spirit based on the thoughts and the things that you let into your ear gates and your eye gates, what you engage in, you know this to be true, and you say, I know, maybe you're a married person and you're, you're getting into an emotional relationship with someone at work, for instance. And you know you shouldn't do it, but you do it anyway. You start talking poorly, say you're a man, and you start talking poorly about your wife. And, and, and you've got that other woman, and, and you know, your wife, maybe your wife is at work, or maybe she's at home, but she's doing a lot of things. And you know, we call it the 80-20 rule. And I know it came from... Um, a popular Christian author, writer, playwright, uh, originally, but many people have adopted that. You know, no, none of us are perfect in performance. And so you, you have a wonderful wife, but this woman at work, she is just always there with kind words. Of course she is. She doesn't have three or four kids at home with you running around while you and your wife are both trying to get things prepared for the day and the frustrations of life and, and knowing each other so well. But she comes along because she's got an eye for you too. So she knows how to fill what you think may be lacking, that 20%. You know how many men and women have traded a wonderful spouse, 
ruined a relationship by engaging for 20. Don't do it. Don't do it. But my point is, you enter an emotional relationship and you continue down that path. And then it begins with light touching. You know, years ago, I'll never forget, I told my wife, I said, we need to pray for so-and-so. He was, at the time, he was a superior in a Fortune 100 company I worked for. Karen and I were planning churches at the time, um, and I didn't take a salary because I had a good salary at my job. Praise God, God provides. And I said, I'm seeing things. I'm seeing things with this female executive who works with us and with this man. And she had even tried to make some advances flirting with me, but I was having no part of it. Listen, whether you like Billy Graham or don't like Billy Graham, I had heard early on from my pastor, even when I was a teenage boy, about Billy Graham and how he wouldn't even get in an elevator with a woman alone. Now, I can't say that I haven't gotten in elevators and I don't pay attention. My wife used to tell me, you truly don't know when people are flirting with you. And I'm older now, and I don't see it, and I don't want to see it, and have no part of that. But um, I, I, I knew that this woman had tried to flirt. And one day, she was going by my desk, and she ran her hand along. I said, please don't touch me. I'm a married man. She took great offense. But I started to notice that this superior of mine, we, we'd be in a meeting, and, and he'd be reading something. She goes, oh, I can't see it. And she'd get up behind him. At the desk and the rest of us the rest of his subordinates high up all all VP levels we were sitting there and this woman she would lean into him and, and the other guys would ogle with their eyes and I would look down and I said to him later that day I said you may not want to hear this I said but when she was leaning over you and into you you are a married man that's inappropriate and man I got reprimanded but I said look I even threatened to fire me and I said, look, I'm telling you. And later, 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 many years later, that man, he is now a born-again believer. He reached out to me, and he told me he lived that way. His wife would be home with their children, raise their children, and every weekend he'd go golfing with the guys. I never did that. When I wasn't working, I wanted to serve the Lord and be with my family and include them in ministry. In fact... Everybody at work knew my kids because I would take them with me quite frequently whenever I could. You want to avoid those things. But that emotional connection with that woman led into a physical connection. And that led that man down a path of when that one ended, he wanted more. And he went through a couple decades of adulterous affairs, and partying, and, and then one day, his wife left him. His children didn't want to talk to him. I am happy to report now. He's not back with his wife, but he does have a relationship with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, now, and a relationship with his children. Praise God for his mercies. But do you get the point? That's, that's what this was like. So Pharaoh says to them, um, no longer are we just going to supply the bricks in this yoke of bondage, but now you're going to have to go, <coughs> excuse me, gather the straw and make your own bricks. Oh, and by the way, we're not lowering your, lowering your quota. You're going to have to do the same amount of work. And if you don't, we're going to beat you. You know, Pharaoh worked them more severely and put them under more bondage. And that is exactly what sin does when we know what we're doing and we don't address it in our lives. The enemy doesn't, the enemy actually does this to us, whether through sin or he'll try to put a heavy burden on you. You know, Psalm 34, 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him from them all. And I'm here to testify. I can, I can tell you account after account, testimony after testimony, when your situation moves 
from really bad to unbearable, often that's when deliverance takes place. Look at these days that we are living in, in these final moments of the end of days. So many are fearful and frightened and in despair. No, we shouldn't be. Do you realize that the same God, our God, the one true God, who multiplied the loaves and fishes, is able to provide for us no matter what the circumstance we think we have brothers and sisters. Christians are the most persecuted group in the world. Satan's strategy, actually his mistake, is he never leaves bad enough alone. I know we've all heard, leave good enough alone. With Satan, he doesn't leave bad enough alone. He's not happy when you're down and you're out and you're going through something. No. Just like that yoke of bondage to the, to the Jews in Egypt. He wants to put more on us and weigh us down. I'm telling you, it is so vital in these final moments of the end of days that we are renewed in our mind. Know your authority and position in Christ far above all power, dominion, rule, and authority. And be washed in the truth of God's word. You're already born again, but we are in a battle right now. And if we could remove the veil and see what's going on in the spiritual realm, many would drop as if dead. So the flaw in Satan's strategy, which is to pile on the plight, is that believers have the Holy Spirit indwelt in us, reminding us of who we are, and our position in Christ. He reminds us of his hased. I have preached on this. This is God's covenant, obligatory love toward his children, his heirs, his co-heirs. That's you and I, born again believers. And when we turn into God, when we press into God, lean into God, I mean, think about America. Think about the condition, and, and I know this is all over the world, but think about the United States of America right now. I'm not going to get into the politics, but I want you to think about it. You know, in the 1970s, I believe it was, the Beatles, and I, for Beatles fans, that's your choice. I never liked the Beatles. Please, you know, don't stone me for that. I know many of my friends do. I never did. I just didn't like their music. I didn't listen to it. But the Beatles said at one point, we are more popular than Jesus Christ in America. How sad is that? How sad is that? We took prayer out of our schools. We legalized the murder of the unborn. We legalized same-sex marriages. We see the plight of what's going on. I talk about this. I don't have to go into this right now, but I am here to tell you, but what the enemy doesn't realize is America, Americans, I see it when I go places, are about to rise up. And I'm not demeaning the fact that things are not falling apart. They are falling into place. We're in the final moments. Listen to me. I know a lot of people are talking about an awakening that's going to be for 100 or 200 years. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. But I will tell you this. An awakening, and the Lord has revealed this to me, can happen in an hour. And I believe America is about to rise up. And like ancient Israel, when Israel had turned from God's ways, was walking in disobedience, shook their fists in the face of a holy God, just like the, the global culture today and America has done, I believe People are rising up, especially the remnant in the church that know that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and our God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We are about to rise up, and many call it a Red Sea moment. We translated it into red. It's actually Red Sea. Back, you guys know, a couple years ago, I said, I'm believing 
for a read C moment. People say to me now, I'm not even going to go into the details of it. Are you still believing like they're mocking me? And I say, glory to God. Not only do I believe it, but I know it. And what's that going to look like? I can't tell you. And even if I could, that's not what this message is about. But God is about to show out in a big way. And maybe, just maybe, it's boom and enlightenment and awakening and shh, we're gone. Hallelujah. To the wedding. Praise God. This dispensation is about to roll up like a scroll. And on this, I am absolutely sure. God is about to do it. We are about to see God show out and the read see moment. You know, when you talk about bad to worse, I can give you testimony after testimony. Let's, let's continue with our culture for a moment. Psalm 119, 126, this is what it says. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. The globalists, they believe that they've got it all in the bag. The plan is set. The one world religion, the, the housing of it, the Abraham house of faith, is being completed right now as I bring this message on Sadot Island off of Abu Dhabi where Jews, Christians, and Muslims will worship together. They are establishing the one world order. We see uh, the, the one world religion. <coughs> we see the one world order rising right before our very eyes. And I believe that the Lord is looking down and if he could say to us right now because many are giving up they're saying I, I, I've been waiting I've been watching nothing's happening the, the bad has gotten worse it's gotten to the place of despair listen I'm here to tell you when you are in that place you must look up and rejoice lean into God press into God I thanked everyone for praying for my grandson. It was a moment where despair could have taken over. But instead, and I give God all the glory because it's yielding the Holy Spirit in me. I leaned into, pressed into God, and I went into prayer. I prayed in the Spirit and not on my watch. I'm going to tell you right now, the devil messed with the wrong grandson and Zadie in this situation. Because God ordained that we would live and breathe and have our being in these final moments of the end of days. And I don't know about you, but all the glory to God. We, the Bible says, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead abides in us, born again believers. That means we have resurrection power in us. Our culture, the, the deep state shadow government. Global shadow government is shaking its fist at a holy God. And I'm here to tell you that God is letting that cup of iniquity fill. And I believe that we are at the precipice. We are at the point where it is going to be to a place where when, not if, when God shows out, which is very soon. No man, no woman, no leader, no nation, and no league of nations will be able to deny that it is the hand of Almighty God. God is about to show out. God responded for the Israelites when things got really bad. When Pharaoh heaped on more bondage and despair upon them. I'm telling you, I can tell you testimony, not only from my own life, but from others. The darker it seems, when you seem like, there's no way out. God steps in. And God is about to step in. Isaiah 58, 19 says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Hallelujah. God is about to lift up a standard. You know, think about Joseph in the Bible. Everything he went through. He was betrayed. His brothers were going to kill him. Instead, they threw him in a pit, and then they sold him into bondage. And where did he go? 
into Egypt, which is a type of the world. He then begins to get favor in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife wanted Joseph to have an affair with her. But he was an honorable man, and he wouldn't do it. And so she accused him of rape. He spent 13 to 14 years in a prison when things looked dark and, and, and it was despair. Like there was no hope. Through a baker and a cupbearer and some dreams, God stepped in. And Joseph found himself going from the pit to the palace and being the second in command of all Egypt. If you don't know the story, go look at it. Because it is amazing. You may think you are going backward. Joseph could have thought, what is going on in my life? Because God had given him dreams the year before. And I'm going to tell you... If God has given you a dream, if God has shown you, if you have sought him, what the destiny is, the call, the ministry, the anointing he has for your life, you may feel like Joseph probably felt. Good grief. I knew that you were going to do this amazing thing, but I'm going backward. I'm going backward. I did the honorable thing, and, and I got accused that I'm in prison. But that didn't happen. Forever. You may think that your life is going backward, that you're moving in reverse, but if you are a born again believer and you are trusting God, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it was one of my wife's favorite verses. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. You're not going in reverse, even though it seems that way. That reverse is moving you into the destiny that God has for you. Press into God. Lean into God. Be renewed in your mind and washed in the purity of the truth of God's word. As I get ready to close this message out, and I hope this has blessed you today. I know many of you are struggling. I want you to know God loves you fiercely and passionately. I love you too. It has been a long week to say the least for me, but I can declare the goodness of God. God is absolutely good. And his mercies endure it forever. The Jews have a saying. I'll just tell you in English. Like when they made it to the Reed Sea. If that's all God did, if Pharaoh caught up with them, it would have been enough. If he had only taken them into the land, into the desert, and they crossed the Red Sea, it would have been enough. It's an attitude that we should adopt. Jesus Christ dying on the cross, shedding his blood, and raising to life. The resurrection was more than enough. Praise God. And yet God continues to bless us beyond measure. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is, it is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Whether it's temptation or the struggle that you're going through, God will not permit you as a born-again believer. And so if you're feeling that way, I want to encourage you, first of all, again, know your identity. Be renewed in your mind and washed in the purity. Of the truth of God's word. Get your praise on. Get your praise on. Praise leads way to victory. I believe this message. May be for actually many. Things have gotten so bad. You're tired. You're exhausted. You're at the end of your rope. It's time. To turn into God. To press into God. To lean into God. And to know that even in the darkest hour, we have evidence from the word of God that deliverance is on its way. 
And in fact, it's here. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Again, I pray you're encouraged by this message. God loves you so much. If you hear nothing else I have said, believe this, that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again. And God loves you fiercely and passionately. Shalom and have an awesome rest of your day.